Well, good morning, Hickory Bible Church. Good morning. Greetings from Southern California and John MacArthur, the Master's University Seminary and Grace Community Church. I uh, flew up from Atlanta yesterday. We uh, had, were with 6,500 folks at the G3 conference. We hosted the Master's Fellowship. And uh, so it's been a busy week, but a fruitful week. And it culminates in being in one of my favorite places on the, you know, on the planet, right here in Hickory, North Carolina. Take your Bible, open if you would please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. This is developed into a series of things that I like to say because it's an observation that in a culture like ours, which undeniably is different than it used to be, and the trend and forecast of what's happening around us, and I will tell you, one of the things I see most often in the churches is discouragement almost a sense of impotence. Maybe the biggest question I get asked is, what do we do? Uh, Listen to this. These are the uh, virtues that define a healthy culture. Number one, honesty. Number two, morality. Number three, let me just stop and pause. Honesty and morality. Three, humility. Four, safety and security. Citizens have a sense that where they live is safe. Stability, number six, number five. Number six, unity. Number seven, the seventh virtue that fosters and defines healthy culture, healthy society is trustworthy. People are trustworthy. Now listen, if I ask you, do you think we're headed up or down? Do you think we're a healthy culture or an unhealthy culture? And I really don't want to give you statistics. I don't want to begin this sermon by making the case. It is self-evident, isn't it? The culture is spiraling. And here we are as Christians in the midst of this change in our nation. And it is grieving. If you grew up in this country, if even just 10 years ago, it was significantly different, different than it is. We've gone from the most pro-life president to the most pro-death president when it comes to children in the history of America. We're in a living in a whole new world and God's people, in my view, are discouraged. It's depressing. And the question is, what do we do? And I come to Hickory, North Carolina today to both call you to something, to encourage you in something, and to challenge you to be something. Because you can change the world. You can change your world. Look with me at Matthew chapter 5. This is Jesus talking, 5, 6, and 7 in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to cover some ground today. We're going to start here, try to unpack a big idea that I hope will cause you to both be encouraged and challenged. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the Magna Carta of the Kingdom of God. This is the King of everything, the second Moses laying down the law the way it really is. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. He's talking about the Kingdom of God. And he, it begins in chapter 5 with these words, which are worth hearing. And when he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, sat down, ex cathedra, it comes from the idea of rabbis, when they taught, they sat down. It was an expression of authority. And watch this, his disciples came to him, verse 2, and opening his mouth, he began to teach them. Now, don't miss opening his mouth. Obviously, if you're going to talk, you have to open your mouth. But there's more behind that phrase than he was talking. Opening his mouth was a figure of speech to say he's about to pour out his heart. He's about to express some core realities that were deep within his conviction as king of the kingdom. He poured out his heart, and he begins, familiar words, with how to be blessed. Nine times, blessed are the poor, blessed poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, the gentle, 
those who thirst for righteousness, verse 7, those who are merciful, those, verse 8, who are pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who've been persecuted. Blessed are you when men revile you. Blessing, this is what attracts it. You want to know what blessing is and how you receive a sense of bounty from heaven? This is the kind of person that is a magnet for that. But I want to focus us, focus us on verse 13, how to be a blessing. Because he makes a statement and he says to kingdom citizens, and if you're a child of God, you're a kingdom of, you're a citizen in the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus is about to say something about you. He's going to say you are something. Watch what he says. Verse 13, you are, as a kingdom citizen, the salt, the definite article, the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Jesus says that if you're a kingdom citizen, not just then, but even today, you are the salt of the earth. Unless you've lost your saltiness. Unless you've become tasteless. Unless you've lost the properties the qualities that define what salt is. In which case, if you become tasteless, this is sobering. You're good for nothing. Except to be thrown out, that's cast aside as if you have no value and trampled underfoot by men. You would be used for a road surface because you weren't valuable in the ways that you should be valued. You are the salt of the earth. Let me begin by saying this to you. You can change the world. You can have, listen to me, critical, impactful, and eternal influence. And you should. Because of who you are. Present active indicative. This is what you are if you're a Christian. This is what you are if you're a kingdom citizen. This is what you are unless you're not behaving as you ought. You are something. Therefore, you need to be something. And that's the challenge of this message. The encouragement, you are something. You don't have to invent this. You don't have to manufacture this. By identity and reality, you are this. And you need to be something so that you reflect this. And here's the encouragement. And the guarantee is your life will mean something. In the sphere of your influence, in the world in which you live in traffic, you'll be a difference maker. Because salt made a difference. Four things I want you to think about today as we consider what you are. Number one, you are a picture of purity. Salt was white when it was refined. You are a powerful preservative. You're salt. Three, you're a provider of pleasure. You're seasoning. And number four, you're a provoker of thirst. You make people thirsty. Let me give you a few highlights about salt. In the ancient world, salt was highly valued. The Greeks called salt divine. In a phrase, which in Latin is a kind of a jingle, the Romans said, there's nothing more useful than the sun and salt. One of the greatest compliments you could give was to call someone the salt of the earth. It was a reference to someone who led a valuable, worthy, meaningful life. Someone whose life counted in the culture. Salt was considered white gold. It was rare. Kings got taxes paid in salt. Roman soldiers got paid with salt. Which is where we get the phrase, he's not worth his salt. Salt was a living wage if a soldier behaved in a worthy way. If you were a solid citizen, you were the salt of the earth. 
When Jesus said these words, both to the Jews, the Romans, and the Greeks, when he said, you are the salt of the earth, he was saying you're valuable. You're rare and supremely valuable. You're worthwhile. You're impactful. You're useful. And by analogy, Jesus was saying of the kingdom citizen, your life is valuable as it expresses the qualities of salt. So I want to talk about those four qualities. And the first one begins with the word purity. Purity. Salt was connected to purity. In the sun, it was glistening. And when it was purified, it was brilliant white. The Romans said that salt was the purest of all things. Why? Because it came from the purest of all things, the sun and the sea. Salt was a primitive offering to the gods, signifying purity. As a matter of fact, you even feel that in Levitical law, Leviticus 2.13, every oblation, said Moses, of your meat offering shall you season with salt. Salt was a symbol of purity. And when Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, purity came to mind. It was one of the characteristics of salt. Listen to 2 Kings chapter 2, 19 through 22. You feel the symbol of the purifying power of salt demonstrated here in this story. The men of the city said to Elisha, the city being Jericho, behold, now the situation of this city is pleasant. Jericho was called the city of palms. It was an oasis in the wilderness an oasis in the sand. They said to Elisha, Behold now, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is barren or unfruitful. And he said, Elisha said, Bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and he went out to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from their death or unfruitfulness any longer. 2 Kings 2.22, so the waters have been purified to this day. Salt was a symbol of purifying power. It was a symbol of purity. And in a similar way, the Christian is a new jar. You're a new creation. You're a new creation vessel, and you're to possess in your person the qualities of salt so that as you are dispensed in the world in which you live, you have a purifying influence. Here's a sobering proverb, Proverbs 25, 26, like a trampled spring and a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Polluted trampled spring, polluted well, what should have brought blessing, pure water, gives bad water. Situation is good, but the water's bad. The land could be fertile and fruitful, but it's not. It's barren. And it's barren because the waters are impure and we need salt to purify those waters. The Christian must be, here's the main point, number one, you must be an inspiring picture of purity. You must be an icon of integrity, a model of morality. Listen, you're the salt of the earth. You're the calibrator for the culture. You're the standard by which people understand this is right, this is not right. Your speech, your conduct, our attitudes, our motives are to be the standard by which men measure themselves. Colossians chapter 4, 6, verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with what? Salt. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, one of the texts that I want to press in on today. Your speech, your conduct, your attitudes, your motives. While you're turning, listen to Titus 2.7. Even to the young men, this is what Titus 
was told by Paul, in all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity, doctrine, truth, dignified, sound in speech, which is above reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame because there is nothing bad to say about you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writing, this is the worthy walking of a Christian who's been bountifully blessed, bombastically blessed, chosen, rescued, restored, reconciled with God. Therefore, verse 1, chapter 5, therefore be imitators of God. As beloved children, walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Listen, live like God as a selfless, forgiving, gracious lover. But watch verse 3. Do not let immorality, pornea, everything from the images to the actions, immorality, the things graphically displayed so prevalent in our culture to the actual activities of immorality. Do not let immorality or any impurity, that's sensuality, or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. Saints are kingdom citizens. Kingdom citizens ought to be honorable and noble in their moral conduct. You're to be a representative of God, not just a selfless lover of people, but a noble ambassador. By the conduct and purity of your life, listen, it's off the charts today. It's not just an immoral culture, it's an immoral Christian culture. I I could quote statistics that would sober us. It would not be an encouragement to you. What is happening in the culture is Christians are not salting the earth. They're being caught up in the current of the culture. You are the salt of the earth unless you've lost your saltiness. In which case you're good for nothing. Except to be thrown out, discarded, not valuable, not worth your salt and trampled underfoot. Listen, here's what's happening in our world today. The world can't tell the difference. And it's not just in the pew or in the seats like where you sit, but in the pulpit like where I'm preaching. The number of pastors and spiritual leaders who forfeit their credibility because of the unrevealed life is catastrophic to the church and to the world watching. I just saw on the news feed this morning the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, a national champion coach from Ohio State, back in Ohio, having some kind of party at a steakhouse that he owns, behaving in ways that caused the media to take pictures and say, this is, and I'm not going to name his name, well, I will, Urban Meyer, here's his behavior, and he's a coach, he's not a Christian to my knowledge. Tim Tebow played for him, witnessed to him. Maybe he came to faith. But the culture expects him in his behavior to reflect the fact that he's a married man. And the footage, the video footage, didn't look like the behavior of a married man. That happens with Christians all over the world. You are the salt of the earth. Conduct yourself in a pure way. Not just in your moral behavior, but in your speech. Watch verse 4. There must be no filthiness. You know what filthiness is? It's a general word for obscenity. It's cussing. There must be no filthiness and silly talk. Morologia, the talk of a fool. Think the tabloids at the checkout counter. Think of the news feeds, the TikTok, and all the stuff that comes over the internet that infatuates and entices your interest. There shouldn't be any conversation about nonsensical, doesn't mean a thing stuff. How in the world people can make a living displaying things that ought to be shameful? We're like, we're like Israel. We've forgotten how to blush in our culture. And 
silly talk is shallow talk. It's celebrity speak. There should be no filthiness, no silly talk. Watch this, or coarse jesting. That's sexual innuendo. It's, it's that glib little line that has double meaning. Watch what it says. Which are not fitting. You're a kingdom citizen. That's what he's going to go on to say. But rather giving him thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God become, comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. You're the soul of the earth. You need to conduct yourself with moral integrity, both in action and in speech. Listen, there ought not be cussing Christians. There ought not be Christians who are glib with their tongue. You're a child of God. You're a kingdom citizen. You're royal in your lineage. Don't be careless with your speech. You know why? You're the salt of the earth. And somebody is defining rude and crude by you. Thirdly, over in Philippians chapter 2, I want to highlight the attitude issue. Pure in attitude. Philippians chapter 2, which this is a page over talks about working out your salvation, chapter 2, verse 12, with fear and trembling. Why? Because it's God at work in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Would you look at verse 14? I was going to quote it, but I want you to look at it. Because it's very language in black and white is so convicting. Do all things. How many, do anybody know what the word all means? All means all, and that's all that all means. I was a seminary professor I took herm hermeneutics from. All means all. Do all things without grumbling. You know what grumbling is? Complaining. There's a bazillion reasons to complain. Flying here from Los Angeles, I had a lot of reasons to complain. Sir, put your mask above your nose. You know how it works. Going through TSA, there's just an abundance of things to trigger frustration. Just turn on the news. Do all things without complaining, without grumbling. It's amopoietic. It's, it's, it's the word. I hate this. So frustrating. My wife gives me a daily rundown of what businesses in Santa Clarita will allow you to go in without a mask and where you have to mask who oppresses you at the door and who doesn't. It's a hard world we're living in, but I'll tell you what, you're the salt of the earth and purity of attitude is you do all things without what? Grumbling. If you want me to put my mask on, I'm putting my mask on. I don't like it, but I'll do it. And watch this other word, do all things without grumbling or what? Disputing. You know what that is? No arguing, no debating. You're positive and you're peaceful. You're the salt of the earth. Why? Verse 15, that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. It's another way of saying pure. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a what? Crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear. Here the symbol or the illustration is you're the light of the world. Your light's in the world. Jesus uses two figures, your salt and your light. In Matthew, 20, Matthew chapter 5, salt has a quality to it and light has a quality to it. Both are beneficial to the culture and it's a perverse, base culture. And what's normal shouldn't be normal. And you as a Christian ought to be in the world, but not of the world, John 17, keeping himself unspotted by it, but providing an inspired picture of what purity looks like in real time. 
You ought to be the person when you walk into the room or you walk into the meeting or you, you're a part of the foursome. I remember in Birmingham when I, I had a couple of buddies I'd play golf with and sometimes we'd be just two of us and they'd, they'd partner us with two other people we'd never met before to make up a foursome and you're off the first tee and I, I'd introduce myself but I never told people what I was or what I did. Just said, I'm Harry. I'm from Hoover. And somewhere along the line, inevitably, I, they would ask, so what do you do? Well, I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm a pastor. Oh, I am so sorry. The language, you know, it instantly changed. Now listen, that wasn't because I had manifested anything. That's because I had an identity descriptor that caused them to believe that there's something about that place, position, and identity that required a valuing of words and conduct that was honorable and virtuous. You don't have to be a pastor to evoke that kind of a response. You need to be a Christian. And I'm not saying because you're judgmental. I expect unbelievers to behave like unbelievers. But I am the salt of the earth, and so are you. Unless you're not salty. Unless you're not potent. Unless you're not pure in conduct, speech, and attitude. Here's another attitude verse, Mark 9, verse 50. Listen to this. Salt is good, Jesus said. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. You know, I'm going to tell you what we can't be. We can't be the salt of the earth and attacking one another on the internet for differences that don't matter. We can't have family squabbles in public. Be careful what you say. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Be at peace with one another. Salt is good. Have salt in yourselves. Be at peace with one another. It's far too easy for us to express frustration and anger towards one another, both privately and publicly. People are learning how to relate by the way we relate. Motives. Why we're in Philippians, do nothing, verse 3, from selfishness or empty conceit. We're in a narcissistic society. You know what that is. I'm infatuated with myself. My world revolves around myself. If I'm not happy in my marriage, I'm going to find another option. If I'm not happy in my job, I'm going to find another option. My whole world revolves around me. And don't think people can't tell whether it's about you or them. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Empty conceit is a a fostering of vanity and interest in yourself. I'm my own PR person. So I'm going on the internet and I'm going to FaceTime or Facebook or whatever. Instagram is probably the right thing. I'm not a social media person, so forgive me for errors of statements in this way. I just know how it works. I'm going to take a picture of myself and I'm going to try to make you believe I've got the best life possible. Don't you wish you were me? That's not the goal. The goal is to encourage, elevate, support, and serve someone else. That's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5, I never came with flattering speech. You know what flattery is? Telling you what you want to hear so you'll give me what I want. Flattery is manipulation. Flattery is to tell you what you want to hear so that I get what I want from you. And Paul said, I never came with flattering speech, nor with a pretext for greed. I didn't want your stuff. I didn't want anything from you. I didn't want glory from men. This is for you and for him, not for me. So whether you're selling cars, you're selling houses, whatever it is you do, it's got to be pure. It's 
got to be pure for them ministry. It's got to be pure for them activity. It's got to be about others, not self. The Christian must be the person who holds aloft the standard of moral purity in speech and in conduct. The Christian is to make someone believe that the best can be credible. You have been called for this purpose, 1 Peter 2.21, since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And the context of 1 Peter 2 is, even if it hurts, you display what is right. 1 John 2.6, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Love like he loved, live like he lived, He was the purest of all. We ought to be lunar reflections of the son of righteousness. Can you say amen to that? You're the salt of the earth, unless you're not. By way of the potency of your presence in the life of people. You're to be a picture of purity in speech, conduct, attitude, purpose, and motive. The world needs to see a new humanity. The power of the gospel is not just a change of status. It's a new creation reality. Old things pass away. All things become new because if you're a Christian, you're a changed person. No matter what you say, no matter what badges you wear, I mean, I would like to bring back what would Jesus do bracelets? not because of a fad or trend. It's just because that's how we ought to be thinking. Number one, inspire by being a picture of purity. Number two, protect by being a powerful preservative. Powerful preservative. Jesus said you are something, therefore you need to be something. The guarantee is your life is going to mean something if you protect by being a powerful preservative preservative, sodium chloride. The second quality of salt has to do with, second big idea is preservation. The second quality that makes salt valuable is that it preserves the value of things. It was commonly used, and this is before refrigeration, which is what made it so valuable. It curbed corruption. It resisted rot. It deterred decay. It stopped spoilage, or at least slowed it down. Salt could not ultimately prevent decay. It just slowed the loss down. It was commonly used to keep things from going bad. Hickory Bible Church. If you're a Christian, and this is a Christian church, Hickory, North Carolina, by your presence, ought to have less corruption by your words, by your life, by your presence, you're to be a preservative, a powerful preservative. Listen, you all know certain people whose company, when you're with them, it's easier to be good. And then you know others that cultivate this quality of relaxing the standards that are good. Some people you would tell that story to and others you would never dream of telling that story to. You're to be the latter. You're to be an inhibitor. Gracious truth tellers. By your presence, listen, you're in a culture that is base and perverse. And part of the reason it's base and perverse is because we're absent absent from it in our potency, and listen to me, and our proximity. Turn over to uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. I want to use that as a place to punctuate potency and proximity as a characteristic necessity of salt. Listen, you've got to be present in the culture. One of the things that's happened, and I get it, I was in uh, Anchorage, Alaska this summer in June, and I uh, had the privilege of staying in Anchorage and I was at the Aspen Suites and at the end of the parking lot on Tudor Avenue in Anchorage, there was a Starbucks and I'm a Starbucks person. I know some people roll their eyes at Starbucks, but I'm good with Starbucks. 
So I was excited to see the Starbucks at the end of the parking lot. That meant I would have what I needed to start my day. And I made my way across to the Starbucks that first morning in Anchorage. And by the way, it hardly ever got dark. I mean, it got dark after midnight and it was light about four in the morning and it was light the rest of the day. I walked over to the Starbucks and I've never seen a Starbucks like this. It looked like somebody was having a rainbow party. Every pillar on the front of the store had a hanging banner of rainbows. The drive through had a lattice work that was covered in a rainbow banner. I went inside, it looked like somebody was having a rainbow birthday party. There was little flags, rainbow colored. Every barista but one had a rainbow mask. And it was the most unfriendly cold Starbucks I've ever been in. Typically, Starbucks wants to make you feel like you're in the neighborhood. Hey, what's your name? Hi, I'm Harry. Okay, they put Harry on my cup. And when my coffee's ready, they call my name. That's the vibe. This one didn't have that vibe. This one was cold and oppressive. And I'll tell you what, those banners were not a celebration of God's preservation. Those banners were the celebration of human confusion, dysfunction, and perversion. I'd forgotten it's June. You know what June is. Let's celebrate everybody's preference for gender. 21 different options if I'm unsure of who I am on the chalkboard going in. Make your choice. The gal hardly looked at me. She did not ask me my name. When my coffee was ready, she said, sir, here's your pike with four Splenda and some cream. I wanted to leave. Here's my thought. I'm gonna find me a Christian coffee shop. And then I got convicted because you know what all those banners were? They were a neon sign. Need salt here. So I'm going to sit down at the table. I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to open my Bible. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to pray for the baristas. Now, I, I did use my phone to take pictures. I'm not a stalker. I just wanted to get the names of the people that were working there. So the five days I was there, I could pray for them and express kindness to them. And then on Sunday at the Anchorage Grace Church, I said, I don't know where you buy your coffee, but I want you to go to Tudor Avenue and buy it from the Rainbow Starbucks. Because we have a saying, right? Not worth a grain of salt. Because a grain is not sufficient when you really need salt. I want you to go buy your coffee at a place that needs your presence and influence. And I'm not saying your Christianity in pious ways. I'm saying your kindness. I'm saying your generosity. I'm saying your quality. Look at Luke 14, verse 34. Therefore, Jesus says, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? How are you going to restore its properties? Look at verse 35, watch this. It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. And then Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Which is a figure of speech to say, you better listen to this. If you've got two ears, you better tune into this. Salt is good unless it isn't salty. In which case, listen, it's not good for the soil. Do you know that a, a proper amount, a dosage of salt is good for soil? Too much of it kills plants. But the right dosage is necessary. That mineral is like fertilizer. It's not good for growth. And you know what the manure pile is. There was a canister with salt in it, and you put salt on the manure pile, whether it's the animals or the person, in order to do what? Inhibit, as a disinfectant would, corruption, germs, and disease. 
If it needs a dose of salt and it's corrupt and stinky, if it's Starbucks on Tudor Avenue, you better pour some salt on it. Not just an ounce or a grain of salt, but a bunch of salt. And if you want to promote growth like fertilizer, you dose the the salt in an appropriate way that fosters growth. You don't drown people in it. You season them with it. And you know what? Here's the main point of this. You've got to be in it and on it. You have to be in the soil or on the manure pile to make any difference in the world. And you know what's happened to the church? We're bunkered. And I get it. It's like, hey, I'm going to find a Christian coffee shop. I'm going to find a Christian motorcycle club. I'm going to find Christian. Hey, listen, I love Christian fellowship, but who's going to salt the corruption and who's going to fertilize the growth needed? You have to be powerfully engaging. You have to be proactively engaging. You've got to be a part of the world that you want to influence. Listen, meat didn't get affected by the salt unless it was saturated in it. It was soaked in it. And the saturation, the high concentration, the potency of the salt affected the capacity to preserve corruption and promote growth. If you understand, would you say amen? Amen. I always like to make sure God's people are with me. We can't bunker up. Somebody wrote a book, Out of the Salt Shaker, Into the World. The salt in your shaker is designed to come out of your shaker. The salt in the church, you're the salt of the earth, is to be dispensed for the good of the community. You're to promote what preserves society. You know what preserves society? clarity on the identity and the reality of God. This is uh, the great commandment. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is God. And Yahweh is one. You know what that means? One of a kind and like no other. Yahweh, the personal name for God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not Allah. It's not anything you want to create. It's not mother nature. It's God. Yahweh is God and there is no other. They're not going to know it unless you tell them. This is not a theologian, but I like this statement. Charlton Heston said, political correctness is just tyranny with manners. I wish for you the courage to be unpopular. Popularity is history's pocket change. Courage is history's true currency. Listen, we love the message that is muted when it comes to there is one God, you need to declare it, he is to be feared. It's not just his mercy that's available, it's his justice and judgment that's inevitable. Listen, we preach a Jesus that, hey, God likes you so much, he'd like you to like him back. I'll tell you what people need. Repent and believe. Repent means He that believes on the Son has life. He that believes not on the Son does not have life, and the wrath of God abides on him. This is no small matter. The wages of sin is death. It's not just death in the grave. It's the second death, where the worm never dies. Listen, the world's not coming to church. Not the kind of church that needs to be taught and challenged and convinced and edified. The church is for the people of God to grow up in the ways of God to tell the people who need God what they need to hear. And part of what they need to hear is there's a God in heaven, only one. He is holy and just. He's willing to offer mercy He has given his only begotten son. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. And he who receives him has life. But if you reject him, you do not have life. And the wrath of God, which is real, will abide on you today and forever. And that's a bad thing. If your friends and family don't know that, you're not salty enough. You need to have courage, couched in grace. I'm not mad. You just need to know this. 
You're a powerful preservative unless you are not. The Christian must be a cleansing antiseptic in any society in which he happens to be. He must be the person who by his presence defeats corruption and makes it easier for others to be good. William Barclay. Hey, will you look at one word at the beginning of verse 34? You see the word therefore? You know what that does? It ties it to what Jesus just said. And you know what he just talked about? Potency. You can't be my disciple unless you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You can't be my disciple if you love anyone more than you love me. You can't be my disciple if you love stuff more than you love me. People, passions, yours, possessions, if you love that more than you love me, you're not potent. Therefore, salt is good. What kind of salt? Potent disciples. Christ over everything. Christ more important than anything. Christ prioritized over everything. I get up in the morning, it's about him, not me. It's not about my kids, it's not about my job. It's about him first. Not that I don't love them. I just don't love them like I love him. It's not like I don't care about my house or my future or my retirement. I just don't love that as much as I love him. That's potency. And when you have Christian disciples who prioritize Christ, therefore salt, that kind of discipleship is good. And you can put it in the soil and you can pour it on the manure pile. Hey, here's a proverb worth knowing. Proverbs 21, 12. The righteous one considers the house of the wicked, turning it to ruin. I had never seen that verse before. Righteous people find the places of corruption and ruin it. They pour an abundance of salt on it. That's what you are. I'll tell you what the culture is, is a reflection in part of the church and its lack of potency and proximity. But here's the good news. You're the salt of the earth. So whatever's going on, you can make a difference. Let me hurry. I've got these last two and I'll be brief. Thirdly, you're the salt of the earth, which means you are a provider and a prompter of pleasure. You know what salt is? A pleasing seasoning. Listen. Blackened steak with the right seasoning is awesome. My mother used to have Jane's crazy mixed up salt. Ever hear of it? I put it on everything. Everything was better with Jane's crazy mixed up salt. I'm not a member of that group. I don't have any financial stake in that. I'm just telling you by way of illustration, salt is a seasoning. Listen to Job 6, verse 6. Job asked, is tasteless food eaten without salt? Or is there flavor in the white of an egg? Answer, no flavor. You got to salt it. You have to season it. Salt is a seasoning. Salt has a powerful ability to add flavor to things, to make things better, more enjoyable, to bring pleasure. The Christian, by his calling, and charged to change the world is to do so by acting as a seasoning that brings pleasure to life. As a Christian, you can bring hope to a depressed world. One out of four young people seriously considers taking their life. Why? Life's not worth living. You in their life ought to manifest and demonstrate amidst all the chaos, there's hope, there's joy. Peace to a worried and angry world. Real joy in a vain, frustrated, and addicted world. Life in a dying world. Comfort to a hurting world. You're the salt of the earth. Listen, if you're in the club, it ought to be better. If you're in the neighborhood, it ought to be better. If you're in the business, it ought to be better. If you're on the team, it ought to be better. More fun, more satisfying. You bring sparkle, vivid life. You're the salt of the earth. unless you're not. Salt, don't lose your flavor. Don't lose your potency. You're the fragrance of Christ to a fallen world. 2 Corinthians 2, 15, where the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved 
end among those who are perishing. Be what you are. Fourthly, you're a provoker of thirst. I love Chinese. Family tradition. Preach the morning services at my church in Birmingham and right up the street, New China Restaurant. I didn't have to order because San knew my order. I'd walk in. She knew what to do. I'd get my bags, go back to my office of my Chinese. My family would be there, family tradition. We would eat Chinese every Sunday after church. And I would drink water for the rest of the afternoon. (laughs) You know why? Salt makes people thirsty. And it should. And what a Christian should do is make people thirsty for a passion for God they see in you. Listen, you should be a winsome Christian. You should be a Christian by the character of your life, by the virtue of your conduct and speech, by the kindness and grace and candor and quality and other-centeredness that causes people to go, I want what you have. You've made me thirsty for something I would have never considered. Can you tell me how to have what you have? Because you have a life I don't have. You have a marriage I don't have. You have a joy when things are not going well that I do not have. You're not insulated from life. Christian people get sick. They die prematurely. They have relational difficulties. They lose their job. They're in tough places. They have accidents. But I'll tell you what they have. They have an anchor of soul that says, my God is good and he controls everything and I can extract good from the not good because God uses hard places to do great things. And who knows that? You know that. Make them thirsty. Make them thirsty by the quality and the character of your life. I'm going to close with this. This is Titus chapter 3, and I just want to show you one thing, and I probably should be done already, but I can't help it. I'm not coming back next Sunday. (laughs) But I want you to see this because it's profoundly powerful if you get it. This is Paul to Titus. Titus is on Crete. Crete's an island in the Mediterranean, and it had a reputation, debauched culture. Matter of fact, in chapter 1, Paul refers to what they, they, they say of themselves. Verse 12, one of them sells, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Culture like our culture. They lie. Anybody know a politician who tells the truth? Protect them because they're rare. We live in a lying culture. We live in a self-interested, dominated by desire culture. Animals. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Crete. He tells them to remember, and I'm going to just hurry for the sake of time so you can see it. At the end of verse 13, it refers to our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself up. This is chapter 2, sorry. Chapter 2 who gave himself up for us that he might redeem us, watch this, from every lawless deed and purify, do you hear it? Himself, a people for his own possession, zealous for what? Good deeds. Good deeds is a theme. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one dis disregard you. Verse 1, chapter 3, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. So the obedience is the obedience of conscience. Obviously, you've got to sort through, can they tell me to do that or not do that? It's not an absolute obedience, but you're to behave in a way that's not inherently rebellious, unless it's a matter of conscience. The Lord requires like gathering. You need to obey, you need to be respectful, and you need to be ready for every good deed. So in action and in attitude, 
If you're gonna affect a debauched culture, you need to have a good attitude. You need to be a pure people, engaged and zealous for good deeds. Look at verse two. To malign no one, to be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Verse three, for we also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts, pleasures, spending our life to, in malice and envy, hurtful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Now, let's look up for a minute. Don't get mad at them. You were once one of them. Don't malign them. You know what it was like to be like that. You were just like them. If anybody should get it, we should get it. And when you engage them, it's good deeds and generous and gracious attitudes. The world is not the enemy. There are people made in the image of God who need salt and life and light in their life. Good deeds from people who have received mercy. God saved me. He can save you. I was just like you. There's hope. There's help. Good deeds. The gracious work of God who according to his amazing grace, and that's what the passage goes on to talk about, not deeds we've done, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing. That's just God can remake you. God can change you. He changed me. You won't believe what he'll do for you. He pours out himself on you. And then look at verse eight. This is a trustworthy statement and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful, watch it, to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men, not just Christians. All right, Hickory Bible Church, attitude and action good deeds, gracious message, gracious attitudes makes people thirsty and it's profitable for them. You are the salt of the world. My prayer for you is you'll be who God has called you to be so that Hickory, North Carolina, or wherever you line up, experiences what they desperately need. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Father, thank you for the time this morning. I know it is been a lot to cover and a lot to say, and it's my prayer for this church that they'll be what you say they are, that they'll want to be that, because there are people around them, family and friends, who need what they are, and I pray that they would model it, they would preserve, they would make things better, and they would provoke a thirst so that people want the God who is, that they would know the gospel that saves and become a part of the kingdom of salt and light. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.